Thank you, Diane. Hello, everybody. My name is Stefan Fütterling, and I'm here with Patrick uh, to present our work at Daimler. Um, uh, how we uh, did the application modernization of the global car configurator and how we brought it onto the OpenShift platform. Our intention was to be here with our um, customer, Benny Rossiat uh, from Daimler, who is our product owner in this engagement, but he had such a heavy workload he could not uh, join us. So we are from Capgemini. We are doing some of uh, Daimler's large uh, business applications. And um, I have an overarching role as technical account manager, um, focusing on innovation topics uh, like application modernization, cloud, and big data. And Patrick, do you want to? Yeah, um, well, I'm actually focusing I'm a developer at Capgemini, uh, and I'm mostly focusing on PaaS platforms and developing applications there. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, start into the content. Um, yeah, many of you might know this webpage, the mercedespenz.com um, webpage. If you enter it, you can see these car models and you have the possibility to enter into the configurator, and you have the possibility to configure your own personalized vehicle. These websites are one of the front-end applications that we have for our global car configurator backend. So what we are talking about is, is the backend uh, behind that um, consuming applications and it holds the vehicle master data, so it knows all about these car models, the equipments, the prices, the taxes, the descriptions in many different languages, and it can check if a configuration can be built in a, in a plant. So more than a year ago, we started uh, a journey here uh, with this global car configurator. And if you look at the left side, you can see the, the starting point where we started. We had a quite traditional Java application. So we had a fixed release cycle with two release cycles per year. We, it was built on a licensed software stack with DB2 and WebSphere. And the development team handed over the, the software as a product to different um, other departments. And those other departments had their own infrastructure. They deployed the application. And they also did the operation for the application. And as you can see, we have even uh, different platforms with uh, Linux and mainframe COS, where the application is uh, running. And uh, where we are today is in the middle of this slide, we have now a central GCC service. And this central CCC servi GCC service is running on a private OpenShift uh, environment in the Daimler Data Center. It's um, set up and uh, operated by T-Systems. And all these consuming applications are now starting to connect to this central GCC. And by the end of the year, we want to have all consuming applications um, migrated to, to the new central GCC. Uh, there's a large business benefit. So now we have continuous delivery. We have zero downtime deployments. We have scalability. We have a very good performance. And we have a cost reduction because we do not need all these uh, operational teams and we, we have, uh, do not have the mainframe and the licensed software anymore. So we are completely on open source, we are cloud ready, we have REST interfaces that are published in the corporate API management. That's the small Apigee box uh, on top. 
And we have a new third party system that is called WLTP. That's the new regulation for um, the emissions of vehicles. And what is now starting is the, the third part here, GCC and microservices. We have already started to um, implement selected functionality from the global car configurator as uh, own microservices. So the GCC itself will get a little bit smaller and will talk to these microservices. And with these microservices, we can avoid redundant functionality in, in different business, business applications. So on the next slide, on the left side, you see still the monolith, the, the big blue box and the functionality inside the monolith. And you can also see that we are having one big database for this monolith. And uh, that's our, still our status quo. And on the right side, you can see this uh, microservices architecture where the special functionality is implemented in microservices and has its own databases and data supply. And we have some architectural decisions made during that journey and also some lessons learned that we have put in the gray box. Um, one learning is uh, we started with JBoss for a fast migration of the monolithic Java JEE application um, into Docker. And we decided to start using Spring Boot if we if implement these microservices here on, on the right side. And we have also decided to use the base containers that are uh, supplied by Red Hat for JBoss and uh, Postgres because we do not uh, want to build our own base containers and do all this maintenance work. So we, we had that decision taken. And now I hand over to Patrick, who will dive deeper into the component model of our application. Thank you, Stefan. Um, now going more to forwards to, I guess, more the technical part of the application, like what did we do in our journey? And there we started off actually with a lot of questions in mind. Um, the first question is how do we integrate uh, the, the application actually into the, uh, into the OpenShift platform, and, and then the second question is, how does OpenShift actually help us? Um, is there anything that helps us? And to that last question, I can totally easily say now, after the journey, um, yes, it, it helps actually a lot. Um, the OpenShift platform gave us a lot of um, things um, that we could easily utilize um, in our application. And how, how we started there, it was actually looking at, we did some sort of assessment um, at the component, comp component model of the application. And there were a lot of components in there um, who were not needed anymore. Um, suddenly, like, we could replace them easily with uh, smaller and easier uh, components. Uh, the only component, and that's the component that you can see there um, in this light blue tealish box there, um, that is actually a business kernel. That's the business functionality. And that's the thing that we want to keep. Um, and uh, OpenShift and allows us that so that we actually have only the business functionality and only some sort of adaptives around that business functionality, which are fairly simple to implement. And um, well, of course, also we implemented also REST interfaces, which are not really related to OpenShift. but. Um, that was really helpful, actually, um, to simplify our application. Um, some examples of what we did there and things that we changed are enlisted there in this table. Um, for instance, we did changes to the configuration beforehand. Um, all the configuration had to be done in different environments um, differently. Um, there were actually different scripts running. Um, others uh, just manually changed the configuration. Um, we actually changed our component model so that it now uses the, the Kubernetes um, or OpenShift platform capabilities there, like config maps, secrets, environment variables. That's how we uh, configure our application now. Then, as already Stefan said, we introduced REST interfaces. The most important part about that is that we integrate, that we use those REST interfaces as some sort of common standard um, throughout the um, Daimler universe. 
and integrated that into the API management solution um, of Daimler. Then we changed the logging. Um, that's a pretty common problem when changing towards a container platform that your containers will probably die or that they have, that you want them to easily die without having any losses. And so we are changed uh, the way how we logged and introduced also JSON logging um, so that we can now aggregate the logs. Fairly simple. Um, Another very important topic for us and for actually performance of the application is um, we introduced caching, distributed remote caches. Um, they were fairly simple to set up on the OpenShift platform. Uh, there we got the Jables data grid um, from Red Hat and we could easily set that up and got a whole cluster running, uh, distributed cache cluster there. Um, lastly, uh, the monitoring topping, um, which in the end, gives us now a lot of insight into the application. And on the other hand, um, well, implementing those liveness checks actually helps also me to have really silent nights so that I do not have to wake up every time a container will um, die. Um, so there are a lot of things that the platform helps us and um, our main achievements and main things that we uh, got from there is that, um, first of all, we can keep the business functionality and just do not just put some small adapters around there. They are really simple to implement and um, replace like, like a lot of complexity from our application with com um, Kubernetes or OpenShift specific um, components. And in the end, also introduce um, blue-green deployment to uh, have zero downtime deployments for the application. Um, now going a little more in depth uh, into the REST interface, I do not want to stretch that too much. Uh, I mean, REST is, I guess, yeah, pretty common. But the interesting part here is, as I already said, that we introduce that into the API management solution of Daimler, which is called One API. And um, there we could again utilize the concept of the platform. Um, we now have a small API gateway running in front of our container. Um, the small API gateway is um, there for um, doing all the authentication stuff. Um, it's actually a pretty good separation of concerns that we have now um, there. Um, and it gathers a lot of metrics, um, which APIs are called, how often, and stuff like that. Um, so that's, yeah, we, are, we were actually coming from SOAP and um, I, that, that is also really, that was actually a problem for us um, in our journey, that there were a lot of uh, different interfaces um, that we were using and that the systems, the consuming applications actually used different um, ways to communicate with the, with the application. Um, now, having all that in place, um, we now had the problem, how do we actually test that? We didn't want to go live, uh, like, easily. We wanted to see what, how does it perform? How would it perform in a productive environment? And that's one thing um, that is, I guess, very interesting also for, for having, um, uh, for everyone who actually wants to move towards such an OpenShift platform. We introduced, um, we introduced actually um, load test scripts, um, which, were, which are run outside of the, uh, outside of the cluster against our, um, our cluster. Um, this load test scripts, these load test scripts um, emulate the usage of the car configurator. So how would a common user of the car configurator use the, applica uh, the, uh, configura the configurator? In our case, he would probably come from a certain market, have speaker language, um, we would randomly select that for him. Um, he would probably choose a random vehicle um, and want to con wants to configure that and changes um, the equipment and in the end maybe gets alternatives um, and selects one of those um, alternatives. And what we could see there is, and that's also very interesting, um, we could see our cluster performing in, in, in like a 
almost live productive environment, um, uh, like productive scenario, um, and see all the auto scaling working, um, see how where maybe bottlenecks are, and I guess that was also a journey for a lot of us um, that. Um, that the cluster itself, we actually helped in, in building up the cluster and there were a lot of settings that we had to adjust so that, not, not a lot of settings, so some settings that had to be adjusted so that um, everything works fine for us. Um, so in this load test, um, we actually created that and we run even longer tests with that. Um, and I would everyone recommend to try to stress your application and uh, of course also the cluster, um, but uh, mostly the application so that you can see that and really try to bring it down. That's the, the interesting part here. Um, lastly, um, I want to speak about, I guess, the most important and also the most difficult part of um, our journey and there we are still working on. Um, that's actually the cultural change, change that we are going through right now, um, it's um, regarding a DevOps operating model. Because um, when we moved to, to this platform, um, there was suddenly a new um, separation between um, tasks of several teams. Um, beforehand, we actually gave the application to some operations team and they operated the virtual machine, they operated the application server um, all for us, and they also operated the um, application for us. Um, but now on, on this platform, um, those guys not, do not operate our containers anymore. They just operate the platform, and that's where they stop. And now there's a gap which has to be filled in, and so, um, that's also learning and that really fits well. We are already recognizing that really um, right now um, that we started to introduce uh, DevOps into um, the processes so that the developers actually start to, to operate um, the software. And in the end, um, yeah, yeah. And in the end are also get, gaining a little more, uh, becoming more responsible for the application. And um, I guess that's something that in the end helps a lot, but it needs a lot of cultural change. Um, yeah. um, importantly to say here is when you start moving towards such a platform, um, think about that pretty soon, I guess, so that you tackle that problem early um, because it can have some impact on, on, the, um, on, the, yeah, on the culture. And and plan your team, or maybe even, yeah, like somehow give your team some more knowledge, do some knowledge transfer to them so that they gain those operations knowledge, the operations knowledge that they need to operate the applications on the platform. Yeah, and lastly, that's the most, that's the one single thing to say here, move towards such a Product, organ, uh, product team organization like a DevOps organization. Well, in regards to the time, thank you very much for hearing me.